Okay, welcome everyone to the Imagine Festival and uh, to this talk, The Future of Partition, Women's Perspectives. I've got a great panel here for you to talk on this subject. My name is Clara Hackett from Falls Community Council. And talking on the subject with me are Julianne Cora Johnson, former Belfast City Councillor turned political commentator. She describes herself as both a covenant loyalist and pragmatic unionist. Sarah Creighton is a lawyer and writer for Slugger O'Toole, who also contributes as a political, political commentator for the BBC. Andre Murphy is the Deputy Director of Relatives for Justice, a national support organisation for victims of the conflict. She is also a journalist and political commentator. Cleanan McBanner is the Development Officer in the James Connolly Visitor Centre, which is Belfast's newest and award-winning visitor attraction. She is a strong advocate for the Irish language and teaches Irish evening classes. Welcome to you all and welcome to this discussion. So I am going to ask each of you in turn just for a couple of minutes to answer this question. What is your vision for the North, Northern Ireland, in the immediate future and further ahead? And when I'm thinking of your vision here, I suppose I'm talking, speaking to the title, the constitutional um, parameters of this. So can I ask, uh, Sarah, can I ask you to start with that first? Yeah, uh, um, first of all, thanks very much for asking me along to do this. Um, it's really good to be here. Um, I came up to the James Conley Centre before to see a talk uh, which Andre hosted with uh, Sophie Long and uh, Don Purvis. I think it was the last event I went to before COVID. So it's quite, it's quite good that now I get to be here as well. Um, so it's a really good question. Um, what's my vision for Northern Ireland in the future? Um, I guess it's a Northern Ireland, obviously within the Union. Obviously, I would like Northern Ireland to stay within the Union. But with Northern Ireland itself, I would like it to be um, a more equal and fair society. You know, I think we've come a long way in the last 20 years. We've made a lot of progress, but I think we have a lot to do. So, you know, um, me with my policy head on, you know, I would like more public housing. I would like to have reform of the welfare system. I would like to get rid of universal credit or get rid of its worst elements. I'd like to have, you know, higher, higher taxes on wealthy people and, and um you know, more uh, like the childcare for Northern Ireland. We don't even have proper childcare. Those type of policy differences to try and make things a bit better for people who live here. And I also would like a Northern Ireland that is a place for everyone. And I think, you know, it is a place for everyone, but again, we have a lot of work to do. So, you know, I, I'm supportive of an Irish language act. I think that is something that we should have. That's something I would like to see in the future. Um, I would, in terms, sorry, in terms of the United Kingdom, I think, you know, um, sometimes I've often wondered, do we maybe need a more federal United Kingdom? Do we maybe need to talk about that sort of thing as well? So my vision for Northern Ireland in the future really is um, a place for everyone, um, a good place for um, women, for children, for working class communities, for, for everybody that lives here, really. And um, that's how I see Northern Ireland in the future, how I want Northern Ireland to look in the future. Thank you, Sarah. And that has set out loads of ideas. Audrey, I'm going to ask you to go next. Thank you, Claire. And I'm not going to disagree with much of what Sarah said, except that I think that those things are achieved on an all island basis. So when I was asked to think about this, what I thought about was a place where um, we all on the island um, are at peace with ourselves and at peace with our histories, that we have at least begun to heal our wounds, our collective wounds from the past, no matter what they were after the impact of partition. I suppose overriding it all is a sense that human rights will no longer be a, 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 a place where we are active in protest or in compromise, that human rights are part of our everyday lives and that that's done in a way that is easy and we nearly take it for granted because it's so much part of our lives rather than the comparison to today. Thank you, Andre. Julianne, can I come to you next? Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Sarah has already said, but I would add to it that I would like Northern Ireland to be synonymous with hope and ambition rather than the fear and division that it's renowned world over for. Um, Policy-wise, I'd like to see a Bill of Rights touching on what Andre said. Human rights are exceptionally important to me. Um, it was conditioned within the Good Friday Agreement that we would have a Bill of Rights or that we would work towards one. Um, and again, that was mentioned in the St Andrews Agreement and also the, the most recent agreement, New Decade, New Approach. Yeah, is that, yeah, <laughs> there's been that many. <laughs> it's hard to keep track. Um, but it, again, that's been mentioned and it's been referenced the Bill of Rights and I'm a huge advocate for that. I'd like to see a Bill of Rights. I'd like to see a universal basic income. And I'd like to see, dare I say it, the more, more, is it more 
what, what's the word? Like, it's not cosmopolitan, is it? More like Europe. Like when you walk in around the streets in Europe and you can sit down, have al fresco dining, you know, the music that's being played. I'd like to see a quarter of the city, the Irish quarter, better developed. I'd like to see more, um, I suppose, more more talking points about our history, celebrating our history rather than it being so divisive and using it to the benefit of everybody in Northern Ireland, boosting our tourism um, and creating a more, um, I suppose, prosperous and peaceful um, society for everyone in Northern Ireland to live. Um, I appreciate how difficult something like that will be given the toxicity that exists. Um, and I suppose the difference in politics of those who are governing this place, um, but, I remain hopeful that something like that is within grasp and can be where there's a political will in a political way. Thank you, Julianne. And Cleana, yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. I agree with, with a lot of, of, of what the, the, the previous three speakers have said. Um, like Andre, I feel that those aims are much more achievable on an all-island basis and an all-Ireland basis. Um, and I feel that um, we will be much closer to achieving those goals. Um, but I agree, um, you know, working together towards a future that is more equal for everyone involved, be that in terms of the health service, be that in terms of um, leisure time, you know, which is equally as important and, and having the opportunity to, to enjoy yourself, um, job opportunities, um, language rights, uh, rights for women, all of those things I think are key to having an equal society, an equal and prosperous society. And I say prosperous, I don't just mean financially, which is obviously important, but I mean prosperous on a on a more human level, maybe, um, that people can can aspire to be happy and to be content here. Um, it's funny, I, I actually have spoken to different friends and family members during the COVID crisis, um, many of whom moved away. It's this time where they, um, and, and, and I, can I add that there were a lot of them who were very much of the opinion that they just wanted out of here when they hit 18, they were like, get me away from this place. Maybe not for the aware of why, and it's only now that they're realizing actually that there there is opportunity here in Ireland in the north wherever you are um, to try and shape a better future for all of us. Um, but I do feel that in terms of the constitutional issue there, which um, of course of course is kind of key to, to today's discussion, um, that all of those things are much more achievable on an all island basis, where I feel that we would have more of a voice and therefore more of an opportunity to achieve them. Thank you, Cleana. I mean, I am struck as you must all be, and you know, our viewers will be as well, how much, you know, similarity there is between you all in terms of, you know, what the vision and what your goals are and where the difference is, is obviously is where this is achievable and where you want, what constitutional setup you want for that. So let's get kind of straight into that then and kind of explore that a little bit more. So I want to ask each of you, I kind of mix it up a wee bit. Um, I'll start with you, Cleana, just to keep going on a bit here. Um, I want you to think about the benefits and the disadvantages of the union. You've already set out that you see the future in uh, all Ireland unity. So, uh, but I want you to consider both aspects of that. Um, one of which will be easier maybe than the other to do. The benefits yeah. and the disadvantages of the status quo of the union. Certainly, and in, and in terms of, of the benefits, I actually think regardless of, of where we end up in the future, uh, one of the benefits is having a good strong relationship with your nearest neighbours. It doesn't matter what constitutionally or where constitutionally we are, be that in re regards to trade or travel. Um, I mean, I work in tourism. Um, we know that our key markets are both here on this island in Ireland um, and coming across from England, Scotland and Wales. So um, it's not that you want to cut the relationship it's that you want to, I suppose, change it. So I do think there are benefits to having that strong relationship um, with the union. Um, but I do feel that actually that the benefits of United Ireland is that we would have much more say, as I said, in terms of where we stand in that relationship. I feel like we would be much more empowered um, as we go forward. I feel like on a kind of a, like a practical and a logical um, level that, you know, things like health infrastructure, um, like sort of basic policies in terms of constitutional things that it just makes sense that we're a relatively small island um, that we will be working together as one. Um, I can't believe I'm saying COVID again. <laughs> we're only 10 minutes in, but if we take the likes of the COVID crisis or 
Brexit, for example, I've said another, you know, uh, forbidden word, I suppose, at the moment. But with all of those things, I just, it baffles me that we wouldn't be taking an all island approach, actually, regardless of the constitution as it stands. Um, but it just seems to make so much sense. Um, infrastructure, I, I worked previously um, in, a, in a, an Irish language organization, which was an all island organization, um, which I, I was based in Uri at the time, and um, would have been up and down to Dublin. And even things like the roads, like the infrastructure, like the tolls, you know, all of those sorts of things just, it seemed mad to me that I was working with people two hours down the road and we were coming from two different places. Um, so yeah, I, I feel that there, there are benefits to both and it's not that we necessarily want to say cut off completely the relationship with the union. I feel we would be much better off, much more empowered to make our own decisions and to have our own, um, have much more control over our own destiny um, if we were taking that on though as an all Ireland, all island basis. Okay. So you've inserted a number of different ideas there and it is, you know, about looking at the relationship between the islands here and then also thinking about you know, how best can you achieve the goals you were talking about earlier. Sarah, what for you are the benefits of the union, which you can outline, but also the disadvantages of the status quo at the minute? I think um, the benefits of the union, there are many as far as I see them. And I think when I think about this question, there's there's the heart and the head for me. So, you know, the, the heart says to me, you know, I obviously I, I'm a unionist. I'm British as well as Irish. And you know, the union allows me to be in a union with with Britain, which I consider to be part of, of my country as well. So there's that aspect of it, but I appreciate that not everybody can can speak to that or not everybody can relate to that, I suppose. Um, in terms of the benefits, I mean, I would say, you know, it's the financial help that we get from Westminster. We've seen that during COVID. Um, we're the union of nations for different nations. I think the union allows us to have our unique identities together and be together. And I do think we are stronger together than if we were separated. Um, I think we have the infrastructure here within the union. So the things that I was talking about in terms of policy, I think we have um, a, a, a grounding there to actually build on that and do that. Um, though admittedly, we need to get the right politicians. That's the, like that's the case in every country, obviously. Um, in terms of disadvantages in its in its current state, I mean, I would say that that you know over the past couple of years, I think it's it's really. I was talking there about different identities together within the union. You are starting to see that. Um, that cause a wee bit of difficulty and especially with Brexit and things like that you've seen different different um, needs uh, clashing together and different uh, different parts of the, of the union want to go in different directions with regard to Brexit and that is quite difficult but I do think that we can resolve that if people could come together and make sensible decisions um, and I don't think that the current Prime Minister is making sensible decisions and I think if there was somebody else in charge somebody else who had a bit of wit <laughs> we might have been able to navigate this a lot easier really so I, I don't think that's that's a, a, a purely because of the union I just think it's because of the people in charge really um so that would that that's really it for me I suppose about those two mm. two options I guess Andre could I ask you to answer the question but also address some of Sarah's points okay so when, when I'm thinking about um, the benefits of the union, I suppose what really occurs to me are human relationships. And it really, um, you know, when I, when I think about growing up in Dublin, which was very much in 1970s, 1980s, a partition state for quite a long time at that stage, very poor, very, um, and the infrastructure wasn't developed. The relationship with Britain was very different to what it is now. Um, it, between the south and the north and also across the islands and I think that that's um, something that's interesting and I think that but what it was consistent then when I moved to the north was that I came to know and to love people with Irish uni unionist identity, British unionist identity and that we had very very much in common and it seems to me that the peoples who um, President Higgins called who live in each other's shelter and their connections to each other is the biggest benefit of union right and what, what that might be called constitutionally I think can change right but I think that that is something that we absolutely cannot lose 
because there is so much that we learn and benefit from each other. And we are so connected generationally, my own grandfather being English and, you know, all of us have those and so many Irish people living in England and vice versa. I mean, we, we are all connected in ways that are multiple and absolutely not, um, you know, Irish versus British. That just doesn't exist, I don't think. So I think that in the constitutional conversation, we need to find a way to give expression to that and that, um, you know, that, that we really we really kind of drill into that and value it so that no matter where this constitutional conversation of the next number of years goes, that we appreciate each other better as a result of having this conversation and that we that we actually have new relationships that are deeper and better. Um, in terms of where I'd like to, that to go um, on an all island basis, you know, I, I, I do feel that, you know, partition has impacted us in ways that have divided us um, across the island and even within the six counties that um, are so ingrained and so destructive that, you know, unity could, you know, I think peace is really possible with unity. In a, in a way that offers new possibilities and more possibilities. Um, and I think that, you know, Clean has touched on the, the very practical things of how we live our lives, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's the economy. And those conversations are very different now, as I say, to what they would have been in the 20th century. I think those 21st century conversations are very different. And even the impact of something like, as Sarah was saying, she raised the block grant you know, there's very, very, there's big differences to what that looks like now to what it would have been 30 years ago in terms of its importance and what Ireland as an island working within the EU and in international markets, you know, just the, the wealth and the creativity that that creates is so different to where in a post-Brexit Britain might end up. That could be quite scary. So I think that, you know, these are complex conversations around benefits and opportunities. Um, and also disadvantages that kind of shift with time and we need to appreciate that and we need to be responsive to that. But I think that overall, you know, I think, I think there's something about British diplomacy and how, you know, traditionally and not in recent times, but there was always a sense of having a conversation that respected the other. And that was brought to our peace process in its earliest of days. Obviously, like, I mean, there's all kinds of things you could throw in there, like John Major denying he was doing it and stuff like that. But overall, this kind of this ideal that we will have conversations in a way that enriches us. And I think that that's where we need to go. And that's something that, you know, I think we've learned together as Irish and British. Thank you, Andre. So turn to you now, Gillian, if you could answer but also take on board some of the points that are made and could I ask you to consider uh, particularly um, because it has been outlined I think by both Andre and Cleana you know the importance of relationships yes in two islands you know and the, the importance of you know actually making those stronger but um, wh what do you see around relationships north and south you know address that in, in your answer yes well. absolutely i was actually That's frantically exactly. writing while all three were speaking um on different points and it was with cleaner i'd wrote here that she'd struck a chord with me when she'd mentioned about the relationships and i do regret that i regret that there isn't a stronger relationship both north and south and i think we had perfect opportunity for that with covid and it's regrettable that you know we are one island um and so transmission is more likely you know than there is the, the rsc i think i tweeted the other day because Simon Hamilton, I think it was, the DUP, or former of the DUP, had said about, you know, we need to be following Boris Johnston and, and you know, being closely aligned with that, you know, and you're thinking, are you mad? Are we just forgetting the fact that there is an Irish sea between <laughs> this island and the rest of the United Kingdom? Um, so, yeah, I do regret that there wasn't closer working relationships there, not just on COVID, but plenty of other things in the past, particularly policy areas where it could have benefited both. Um, so it's certainly very important to me about the relationships. But I think um, you know, in terms of, uh, I'll touch off first on the, the concept of being, you know, within the union and, you know, unity. Um, for me, I want Northern Ireland to remain in the union, but devolved within the union. 
And I want to see that devolution strengthened, um, you know, so that we're able to determine our own policies and those things that are currently reserved matters, um, which I suppose is a bit messy. Um, but the reason I say that, and I'm going to be quite blunt and, and put it this way, is we have Tories to the right of us and Tories to the left. And here we are stuck in the middle. With unity, it won't be any of the parties in Northern Ireland that are determined in the future for the people that live here. It will be the Tories down south. And it'll be the Tories across the water that agree to or allow us to have any sort of border referendum. So, you know, I think that I speak for all of us here when I say that none of us like to be represented by Tories. Um, and that, that for me is one of the, the cruxes of this problem is that we negate the fact that it is, again, Tories to the left of us, Tories to the right. So I like devolution. I like that Northern Ireland is devolved. I like that we're able to get that subvention to support us, but I regret that we haven't utilised the opportunities that we have had here in Northern Ireland to further strengthen our hand fiscally, financially, and in terms of the socioeconomic benefits to the, the wealth of its citizens, um, so to speak. But there, there are benefits to that devolution. OK, so I'm not talking necessarily about Northern Ireland within the Union. Yes, significant benefits. Sarah's already touched on that, but the free health care, the free education, the free security. But within that Union, there's a lot that we have been able to celebrate that Northern Ireland, not England, Scotland or Wales, but Northern Ireland has achieved. And I wrote some down here um, that I wanted to, to mention. You know, obviously, we've got this growing film and television industry. Um, in Northern Ireland, you know, and that's done by the, the people here. It's our landscape, it's our scenery, it's the talent, it's the skills that we have here. Um, Belfast, it's one of the top 10 tech cities, um, you know, ahead of Madrid, Frankfurt, Zurich, Madrid, um, or sorry, yeah, Milan, sorry, Milan. Um, it's number one in terms of international investment. Um, it's a, you know investment location for cybersecurity firms. We had the Rapid7, we've got White Hat and Black Duck. Who comes up with these names? I don't know, but they, these are the ones that are here <laughs> in Northern Ireland. And you know, over 30% of world airlines, uh, their seats are made here in Northern Ireland. You know, we are a place that all of this success wasn't built necessarily on our relationship with the Union um, or that we share an island with uh, the Republic, but it was built because of Northern Ireland, because of the skill set here, because of the people here. We make Northern Ireland. Um, and so for me, um, the, the element of devolution is ridiculously important for me. Um, but devolution within the context of the United Kingdom because of the infrastructure. The infrastructure is already there. The education, the healthcare and the social security. But I think I said in my open remarks um, about the social security, Sarah said it quite articulately about scrapping, you know, universal credit. You know, it's a, an absolute embarrassment that we have people in this day and age needing to go to food banks, needing to... You know, I'll not, I'll not go off on a political spiel, but I will say that um, universal basic income is something that's achievable and that can be set out by and determined by the people here in Northern Ireland and our politicians. And for me, that's a localised democracy where, yes, OK, DUP is potentially the small Tories, um, you know, and, and arguably with mandatory coalition, you're not necessarily getting one ideology, you're getting two, um, where I, I don't know where the term Chuckle Brothers was coined, but I call it the Chuckle Brothers because it's, you know, me to you, me to you, me to you. Um, so uh, I, I would be, um, I think Northern Ireland is best placed within constitutionally, sorry, it's not a cat, uh, <laughs> constitutionally, <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being bombed here by the cat, she's going to rest here, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I personally think Northern Ireland in terms of every common sense argument that I can find links to Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom. Do I want a better shared island, you know, in terms of what we can do and building relationships together and where we can have shared interests in terms of the economy? And, you know, even with the, the situation we find ourselves in um, with Brexit, you know, I'd like to see that benefit the people of this island in some way, shape or form. Um, so, you know, I very much have that at the forefront of my mind about the relationships that we have and Cleanna and, and both Andre, Andre had mentioned it too, about the relationships and having that, that strong relationship. Um, but I don't think that, you know, anybody that's setting out to try and retain us within the union, if it came from political unionism, they're never going to win an argument on sovereignty and patriotism, you know, it's, I'm trying not to swear <laughs> for, for, the, for the things that I want to say. I'm really struggling. Um, 
but yeah, I'll just finish with that. Tories to the left of us, Tories to the right, you know, and I agree. We can work together to make this place the best possible place that it can be for the shared traditions, shared entities and nationalities that live here and call this place home. Um, Cleana, I want you to take up then some of Julianne's points, particularly around the idea, um, and I think Sarah said it as well, what you were saying to begin is like it just doesn't make sense to have this kind of partition on the island. There needs to be, you know, just spatially and the way we connect with each other. And both Sarah and Julianne are kind of saying, look, it is possible to do loads of work on all of that. It is possible to have lots more cooperation, you know, uh, across the island, but it doesn't need um, to happen within an all Ireland you know, constitutional position, that, that isn't necessary. Do you want to kind of take up that point? And then I think I want to get on to, as um, Sarah raised it, so if you could touch on this as well, um, because uh, where does the heart come into this, do you know, in terms of like where you saw all are as well? Yeah, certainly. Um, and, and I agree with, with Sarah and with Julian definitely in terms of current political representation in Westminster is far from what I think the vast majority of people um, election results aside, um, really want, um, you know, the last few years in particular, but really the last 10 to 15 years, Tory austerity has done nobody any favours other than those who already had enough wealth to do them. Um, universal credit is an embarrassment. It's, I mean, I've seen people go through the process um, who are more than in need and it would break your heart to hear some of the stories and to see what people have been put through, like like embarrassing, um, humiliating, totally devoid of humanity. The system is is so corrupt. Um, I could do a talk myself on that to be a rant, but um, I, I agree. And, and I have to say on an all island basis for anyone, like I wouldn't vote for who's in power in the South and I wouldn't vote for who's in power in Westminster on policy either. Um, I do think um, that and, and I think this is where the all island argument comes into it. I feel like we would be better represented um, in on an all island basis if we look at it on policy. So if we if we like if we take this group here and we're we're a small small cohort, but if we strip the constitutional issue away from this discussion, I imagine we seem to have to, to have agreed on the vast majority of things. Um, and I do feel that people here. Um, I do feel that people here w w would agree with us on a lot of those things anyway, because they seem like like basics. Um, and I, I just I just feel that on an all island basis, I feel like in, in certainly from a Westminster perspective, that we are nothing but a massive pain in the backside, that we are um, a, a plug hole for money, that we have issues with our past, that Westminster seem to think that they have no association with, that oh, they're, they're arguing about this again, uh, when actually in reality they have a major part to play and could play a major part in terms of, um, I suppose, improving um, those issues in terms of information and things like that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm always so concerned about people representing me who don't care, be that in Belfast City Council, be that in Stormont or in the Dáil or in Westminster. And I, and I just feel that those people in Westminster don't care about it here, be, be a loyalist or a Republican or a nationalist or somebody who doesn't really care. Um, and I feel that on an all-island basis, if we were approaching this all-Ireland approach, then that we would be able to improve the representation that we have um, for people who who represent our views. Be that, on, on a, and I don't, I don't even mean on a, I don't know if I'm, I'm communicating this properly. I just feel we'd have more of a voice and that's to me that's that's so crucial in all of this. Um, Julianne touched on, which I thought was 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 so true. And as, as I mentioned, I, I work in tourism, which has developed massively here in the last 20, 25 years. Um, it's certainly an industry that like, you know, even when I was at school, it wasn't really a thing that you would have known as as a job. And and there are so many things like that that have developed, and we have the talent here. Um, I don't even think that's a north-south thing, to be honest. I think that's an urban rural uh, and east-west. Uh, um, thing and I, I just again I feel like if we had an all island approach like we have so much to offer here in Ireland we have views we have skills um, and I think that if the infrastructure was developed on an all island basis again it would be much more attractive at the moment for example if somebody um, is filming in, in Derry um, up in the north coast and 
that beautiful causeway coast and things like that there and they want to fill in the end in Donegal uh, which is equally as stunning um if you're based in Warren, but absolutely beautiful it's just another barrier because of the issues around logistics around paperwork around financials to me it's about removing those obstacles to allow all of us as an island to get to where we want to be um and i and i do feel that on that all island basis we would have more of a chance of that because you'd have more of a voice and therefore we would improve as one voice you know it's like i mean i'm in the james Connolly center you know it's like having a trade union you know the 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 power of that grouping together is much more so than 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 the sum of the the individual parts if that answered your question claire thank you yes and um, sarah can i ask you then to address some of these points um, that Clean is making, and particularly this idea that um, in the context of the UK, Northern Ireland is so small and tiny and so disposable almost, you know, is what has been said, and uh, has so little power over the big decision-making, you know, um, unit, which is uh, Westminster. So how, how can that realistically work to kind of make the changes that you want to see? No, I, I thought Glennis she made a lot of really good points. And, you know, I've, I've always said that one of the thing about Northern Ireland is I, I have more in common with a nationalist and Republican in Northern Ireland that I do probably with somebody in the Republic or somebody in Britain. You know, I, I we're, we're the same type of people. We're just on different sides about on different issues. That's probably very simplistic, but that, that's honestly how I feel. You know, you meet somebody from Northern Ireland and you, you just instantly connect. Um, I think for me, you know, the, the issue about Northern Ireland, obviously, and I, I've written about it a lot, you know, that we've, we've often feel ignored and left out and there's no doubt that is the case within Westminster. I guess I'm just, I'm not convinced it would be the same with Dublin. You know, um, I suppose my worry is that if we were to join with the South, that, you know, the DUP and Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael will be best mates. <laughs> and who, who's going to be the Northern Ireland representation in the Doyle? Is it going to be the DUP? Because, you know, there's there's an issue, particularly for, you know, we we London unionists like me and Julianne, you know, we're not really that well represented anyway. And I suppose there's that fear that if we join with the South, that it's just going to cement the voices of the people in Northern Ireland uh, that are already here, that we already feel like don't speak for us. So I suppose that that is one of my worries um, in, in regard to that um, issue. But obviously, yes, I do think, you know, if, if we were able to work together, and I like the idea of us like forming like a sort of trade union, regardless of where we are, whether we're, you know, in unity with the South or with, with Westminster, and, you know, particularly with, I hate to mention the protocol, but with that issue, you know, I've always thought, goodness, if we, if, if despite the fact that we disagree on Brexit and everything else, if we could have formed a united approach and worked together to try and understood each other's concerns, and I think a lot of that um, has been forgotten, and particularly by, by the folk that you know that led us into Brexit in the first place, I think there's been a real lack of, of understanding. But if we were able to get together and actually put forward a united front, maybe we could have had more more clout. But I, I guess with regard to you know Clint's point about about the South, I suppose I just worry that we would be the Eamon Ryan <laughs> of any coalition, and you know he's not exactly well thought of anyway. But I think you know regardless of what happens, I think we need to build relationships between Northern Ireland with each other. And as I said, I've I've more in common um, with people here than I do with anybody else anywhere in the world and I don't think that's going to change regardless of what happens with the constitution. Thank you Sarah and, and we, you've moved us along directly there to kind of the risks and opportunities um, of unity and Andre I want you to directly answer um, Sarah's point here about in a united Ireland context right-wing forces would prevail we would be no more empowered. Yeah so um, Listening to those the number of contributions, something that occurs to me is some idea that devolution could in some way improve. And I think in 2017, I certainly um, was at the point where I went, devolution doesn't work and it isn't going to work. Um, and I think that, you know, no one different is coming forward. There isn't a progressive alliance that's coming forward in the North that's going to change all of that. Um, I think, and I think that's the direct impact of partition. I think, you know, if we're looking at fundamental change and it can create, there's no doubt that the that partition created reactionary right wing forces in the south as much as it did in the north. And women and children were the victims of that. There was a war against women and children on this island, on both sides of the border, and that is a direct result of partition and is a million miles away from you know, a, a proclamation that could have been a constitution that talked about cherishing all of the children equally. Far from it. 
And I think that if we're looking at transformation, we have to be honest in saying that there are elements that we live with on both sides of the border that we can learn from each other. So education is broken in the North. Every single indicator on education shows that um, people in the South are far surpassing um, those in the North, even, you know, and that the system that is broken based on inequality and with no signs anyway soon after all these years of devolution because there's just political disagreement about it. Meanwhile, you have an education system in the South that is outperforming it on every single indicator. And that is absolutely what is attracting all of that inward and international investment into the South. You know, and if we want to make that transformation, then I think an all island basis of learning the best is, is absolutely there. And health, the North has, you know, people are wedded to the idea of a national health system where, you know, they, there's free at, at the point of need and the point of entry. And that's something that people absolutely want to carry into a new island. And I think that if anything encourages the debate in the South, and I'm, I'll be honest, it's not a big debate in the South the way it is here. I think it is the idea that you could transform healthcare in a way that is that does meet the needs of a population. In terms of the voice of, the, of um, those in the North, I think it would be completely transformative to have an all island basis. I do think that there is something in a, in a federal approach you know that that there would be something that that would recognise, and um, that would recognise Stormont, and I think that we need to really interrogate that and get into that in a, in a far more kind of less kind of superficial way than what we've been doing in recent years. And I think we need to interrogate what that might look like. But I do know that the institutions in the south are absolutely. Um, open to, but also very wary of the idea of the huge change that having all of this population coming into central and Dublin and changing pol politics and changing uh, the way that we would do politics. I think that that's re really important and, and can't be lost. It will, no matter what happens, it will not be more of the same. Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are already beginning to merge. And, you know, it, one of them is losing out and it certainly looks like it's Fianna Fáil, which I could never have predicted this time last year. Um, and, you know, so your Fine Gael will become the bloc. Fine, Fine Gael are much more effective at opposing DUP policy in recent years than anybody else in, the, in terms of it. when you look at Fianna Fáil when it's been in government has done it far, far less effectively. Than, than what Fine Gael has done in, in terms of the Brexit debate and in terms of the COVID debate, in terms of uh, you know, all of those things that went before. And that is really interesting to look at. I think that what you would see is a complete shakeup of politics on the island. Sinn Féin as a, as a political party would completely change as well. You know, where, where you have um, the Sinn Féin in the South and Sinn Féin in the North do look kind of the same, but they are quite different in how they do their politics and how it, and how it works itself out because of the nature of, of devolution in the North. So it'd be really interesting to see what that becomes in a new island and, what, what, and how we even view ourselves. That idea of green and orange would completely shift if it hasn't shifted already. When all of those things would completely shift too. So I think that we need to see that there would be a realignment on everything from the economy to our social services to our relationships and to how politics would identify itself. Thank you, Andre. Julianne, can you come back on some of those points? Because what Andre is outlining is the opportunities and the kind of transformative, potentially transformative process that that could happen. And is that something you have considered in that way before? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'm not one of those unionists that have shied away from the conversation about a united Ireland. You know, I have no fear in having the conversation at all. Um, again, I throw my hands up, you know, I'm not aligning to it. But I think one of the most important things, uh, probably one of the biggest things that we need to get to do in Northern Ireland is listen to each other. Um, we always go into these debates and these panels to win rather than listen. 
you know um so that's a key thing for me um is, is always listening so i mean i'm not frightened to listen I'm, I'm bold enough and brave enough to say that you know there's been a history a terrible awful history of oppression in this place um that was handed down by people that claim to represent me um you know people who i've been oppressed by also um you know in terms of my sexual identity and my relationship with my soon-to-be wife silly partnered we're getting married here on the 30th <laughs> i can't invite you i'm sorry <laughs> we'll go but um but yeah, you know, so it, 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 there's a really terrible and a deeply embarrassing history in this place where we treated people as lesser citizens. When I say we, I hate saying we because I don't feel connected to that. And I don't think that I'm responsible for the actions of others long before me. Um, I think the best thing that I can do is stand up and say, not in my name, you know, that's not something that I would have agreed with or something that I would have wanted, um, you know, so... Th- I, th- I think that's the first thing and when we put that into the context you know of the whole conversation north south i feel the same there's the potential for the same in a republic um i feel that you know i'll use for example you know andre had mentioned about Sinn fein and i remember whenever i was first elected at the time i was told that i was Sinn fein but with a union jack on um is basically what i was told because our policies were quite similar um, and largely the things that separated us most were the constitutional issues. And there was some things like corporation tax and things like that, you know, where we had differences and the policies were different. Um, but you know, we had a really good working relationship. And similarly with DUP on council, I had a very good working relationship with them also, despite our very obvious political differences. Um, but both of these parties, so DUP, I would align with Tories. And Sinn Féin, I would say, are more, I wouldn't say the right, right socialist. Um, I don't necessarily feel that way. They would describe themselves differently. Um, maybe socially democratic. Um, I don't know. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily align with all of their policies. But I look at Sinn Féin, they've had the opportunity in power, as has DUP. So DUP have had this opportunity for decades now to sell the union as it would be to those who were, who were historically oppressed um, and to make this place their home to make them feel at home. And they have failed to do that. North Belfast ranks number two with the highest levels of multiple deprivation. In fact, all of the areas that rank within the high levels of multiple deprivation are both Sinn Féin and DUP areas. Um, So here we have this coalition of two politically, ideologically opposite parties and we have no progress. So do we really think that there's going to be progress in the context of the United Ireland where we've got two super large parties, if you know, uh, I can't say them right, I just say FG and FF, <laughs> sorry, um, you know, those that Leo and, and Martin, um, they're marching, so those two, um, so I would, you know, I, I would argue that it would be exactly the same, you know, except for Tories to the left of us, Tories to the right, the only people that can make this better is the people that are resident here in Northern Ireland, and we have that infrastructure to do it, we have devolved health, we have devolved education, let's change it, Katrina Rianne started something, but it's never been finished, you know, let's fix it, the same with health service, we've got that, we have got the power to transform the National Health Service, not necessarily our politicians, but we as people. And Andre had mentioned about there's no progressive alliance, so to speak. That's what's missing in this place. That is truly what's missing. Non-constitutional politics, but politics for socioeconomic change. And that's what's missing in this place, where we just park that constitutional question and, and move forward for Northern Ireland. Because let me tell you, People will argue with you that, you know, Northern Ireland is British this and it's British that. We know it's not. You know, it's part okay of the British Isles. But the people that are living here have multiple different nationalities. And it's not just British. It's not just Irish. We have Chinese people living here that, you know, are not necessarily native of here that have come and made this place their home. Which is why I go back to that we make Northern Ireland. It's so diverse. You know, everything's so diverse in this place. It's people, our cultures, our traditions. Everything's diverse. We're a special case. You know, we aren't Dublin and we certainly aren't Little England. We are a special place. So let's use our unique circumstances as a special place to build a special type of government that works for everyone in this place. You know, and and I look at the likes of Stormont, you know, I'm sure everybody would agree with me here. Andre had mentioned about times that she's looked at just devolution isn't working. It's not happening. See, if I ask you to look a little bit below in terms of the level of governments, councils are working. Yes, 
Yes, there's controversy. Yes, there's fallouts. Yes, you know, there, there's heated exchanges. But every month that council meets because it can't collapse. They have to govern together. There is many coalitions. These parties have to work in many coalitions and these parties need each other basically to progress their manifesto and the promises that they've made to their electorate. Right now, we can't do that. Our system of government has Sinn Féin, who I would maybe be leading towards their education policy, certainly wouldn't be leading with the DUP's education policy, you know, but Sinn Féin, in order for them to get the education portfolio against that split, one for you, one for me, but I might also like their housing policy, but because they don't get the Department of Communities, I don't see a housing policy materialising. Do you know? So it's that splitting of power. It's not power sharing. It's the splitting of power that we have in this place. And the sooner that we wake up and realise, actually, we are part of the problem. This government is part of the problem, but we are also the solution. And the solution for me isn't the constitutional question. It's about the socioeconomic change. Will we make this place work for the people that live here? Um, I just went off one there, didn't I? Okay, well, look, what's becoming really clear, must be really clear to the viewers, is that you all believe passionately in transformation, but yes. you know the context in which you feel the transformation is going to happen, uh, best going to happen, you know, is different. And you're still, obviously, do you know what I mean? That's the position that you are outlining. I want us to kind of look then about the context we're operating in at the minute um, and consider... Uh, what kind of things might come to bear on us, do you know, in the times coming ahead? And for example, let's look at the question of um, Scottish independence, which is on, you know, the agenda. You can talk also if you want about uh, English nationalism and, and Brexit, but Cleana, what do you think that means for us here and where we are in uh, terms of a constitutional position. And then I'll come to you next, Sarah. Yeah, so I, I find it really interesting and, and just picking up on points that, that different people have said, um, our, our kind of, our broader politics, our broader um, context, as you put it, Claire, is crucial in the sense that this conversation that we are having now would not have happened five, 10 years ago with the same people that are, say, in this room, in this Zoom. Um, it just it just wouldn't have the very fact that it is happening that it's happening look you know on a, on a I don't mean a local level but on a one to one level that it's happening in terms of political and I and I say this is the only non political commentator here um, on a political commentator level it's happening in the media it's happening within politics it's hit, happening you know within Stormont within the Dáil within Westminster um, and as you mentioned Claire within Scotland I think. That it's that it's like, I feel personally. So I, I do believe that there will be a United Ireland in the foreseeable future. I think it's quite clear that I that I hope there is, but I do believe there will. And I feel like it'll be one of those things. Um, I, I studied history right up to to university, and and there are times when you kind of look back at different periods, and you know if you do, for example, I would have always done like a timeline with key events when I'm kind of trying to scope something out, and you're going how did they not see what was coming down the line? Like, was somebody running about with their head under under the, the pillow or something and, and they didn't see it? And I, and I feel like this is going to be one of those times where we look back and we look at Scotland in, in 2014 uh, um, and we look at Brexit and we look at the conversations that have been happening more and more consistently over the last, say, 18 months, two, three years um, and more and more regularly. And I feel like we're going to look back and go, well, yeah, obviously, because that that approach is changing. I feel like Scotland got got, got this close to doing it um, in, in 2014. And I feel like everything that's happened since. Um, and, and I feel like there'll be a lot of people in Scotland tipping their hats to Boris Johnson. Going, Thanks very much. That was great propaganda. We didn't even have to pay you. Um, because, I mean, what better advertisement for, for having your own government and your own constitution in your own country? Um, do you know, I, I just... I feel like it's happening now. I feel like because we're in it, we don't see it maybe as clearly, um, but I feel like when we look back. So I think it's important to note as well, though, that, you know, when I'm drawing this back just to, to, to partition and because it is sort of the next stage of that, whatever way it goes, I feel like partition, I mean, I, I feel like it was a mess of a thing, obviously, um, but I, it didn't work. It hasn't worked. You know, the very conversation that we're having, the points that we're making, it hasn't worked for any of us, really. Um, we aren't represented, there are right-wing governments 
are all over the show. Um, I feel like this is an opportunity to kind of hit the reset button a wee bit, to to try and bring in all of those elements um, that we're talking about. Sarah and Julianne are, are right. I mean, from from an, I mean, I'm not a loyalist, um, but I, I don't see any political representation for people who don't agree with the DUP, essentially, which is a right wing unionist um, outlook. Um, I feel like this opportunity to, to start again and, and um, Fraser, you know, to, to join the South. I don't, I don't want to join the South as it is. Um, there are lots of elements of it that I, that I don't think work. There are lots of elements of here that I don't think work. But as was mentioned as well, there are lots of elements of both that do. And I just feel like this is our chance to say, OK, let's lay out a plan because, I mean, Bragg's the, the key um, indicator as to what happens when you don't. Um, and let's see what works. Let's see what will work. Let's see how we can implement that. Um, and, I, and I agree that in terms of political representation, I, I find it very interesting. I, I know a number of people who have been in councils um, across the North um, and in the South. And I always find it fascinating. I, I've never been in that world myself. I always find it fascinating what Julianne was mentioning in terms of relationships on a one-to-one -one basis. So I've seen people have an AR and a cup of tea before they go into, for example, a council meeting or whatever. And they're saying, lit literally people saying, Look, I agree with you, but look, I'm not going to say that in there. I'm going in and going hell for leather against this point. And I'm thinking, you know, if you're part of, of a, me, if you're part of a group and that you, you're being asked to fundamentally disagree with publicly with what you actually privately agree with, there's an issue there within those parties. But I do feel that that happens across the board. Um, and I feel like if we could bring that local level representation sort of above that, you know, if we can bring those one-on-one -on -one conversations, I, I just feel sometimes there's a wee bit of maybe of grandstanding. Um and and I feel like I feel like if we if we kept it more real, um that that maybe that would be that would better serve everybody. Um and I suppose in terms of Scotland again, Claire, you know, they've made the arguments they did lay out some some level of a plan and stuff when they looked at independence. I think that's crucial. Um, I think one of the key elements of that is the likes of what Sarah mentioned in terms of the block grant and Andre as well. Um, I, I always kind of feel when, when it comes to finances in the north, and I, I imagine Scotland is to some degree the same, that like we're like a cherry getting their pocket money at the weekend. And um it's like, no, well, you're only getting two pounds this weekend. And actually, I didn't get paid till a couple of days later. So it's only 150 now. So you have to do exactly the same things as you did last week. Whereas I feel like if we were in our own um in our own country, in our own um representing as an all island, as an all Ireland, that we would have much better control and say, Well, look, we were skint last weekend, but where can we do it? Can we charge people who can afford it more? Can we charge the wealthy? Um can we bring in a better housing plan so that we're not giving out as much in terms, you know, can we balance the books, provide more, allow people, um, again, that not just that that financial wealth, but that wealth of life. Um, and therefore, as a society, that, that improves society, you know, it, it's kind of that, sorry, but kind of like that, that bread and roses idea, you know, we can't just hand out money left, right and centre and, and not have a quality of life. And I just feel like if we are con consistently represented by Westminster, and I think Scotland has gotten to that stage and again, COVID has, has highlighted so many issues across the board um, where they realised, you know, they had the opportunity in 2014, it didn't pan out. Um, and everything that has happened since, to my view, and I'm saying it as someone, you know, obviously an outsider, um, has simply vindicated that argument um, and I feel like the same thing's happening now and I do I think when um, Julianne mentions just getting married I'm, I'm hoping to get married in October as well <laughs> COVID allowing and, and I do hope to someday have a family and I feel like when my kids come in and they're they're studying history and um and they're saying mommy what were you that do you know what I mean like they're gonna be like how did you not see that coming um I feel I feel like we're gonna have that moment I feel like we're gonna have that yeah that was actually great yeah. So you're talking about, you know, that we're in such a time of change and um, that feels almost inevitable to you. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to ask you next to come in and build on some of that, Andre, and then come to you, Sarah. And um, Sarah, I'll be asking you to particularly address this point around dependency, do you know, and that kind of dependency culture here. But Andre, what do you see um, the difference that has been created by, you know, having a movement for Scottish independence? Um, would that make a difference to what happens here? 
and what has already been changed by the Brexit vote. I'm just going to correct something that I said earlier because I did use the term progressive alliance and what I should have said was progressive politics rather than that because that hasn't emerged. I think around Brexit, interestingly and connected to your question, we did see the emergence of an alliance that was pro-Remain that recognised um, the local democratic wishes of people to remain in the EU. Um, though that kind of works at times and it doesn't work at other times for different reasons. I think... We have to look globally and see the influence that has on our local politics. So what's happening in Scotland absolutely exposes the democratic deficit that we experience. And on this island, we see the democratic deficit. And then when we see what particularly happened with the EU to no longer have an influence on the decisions that have been absolutely critical to us emerging from conflict is, is astonishing. I mean, it just feels like a, you know we have this huge democratic deficit now. I know that Scotland feels exactly the same, that where they didn't have influence in Westminster, they did in Europe. And that has just heightened the sense of you know, identity, of recognizing their own needs. Um, and on this island, we, we look to, well, what have our needs been in terms of the peace process? in terms of economic prosperity, and most importantly, in terms of human rights. So at the minute, we live under a devolved administration where um, human rights is meant to be the cornerstone and the governing governance of how devolution works. And we know that it doesn't. So we see all of these areas like, and even with councils, you know, where language and cultural rights are not respected beyond Belfast and Derry. Beyond that, they're not respected at all. And the sense of being Irish in your own country is completely dismissed and diminished. Um, I think there's been a concerted effort to try, you know, when we said this, uh, this idea that Peter Robinson had, right, of Northern Ireland PLC and making Northern Ireland work, had they done that? That was the biggest threat to the demand for a united Ireland that could have happened. But instead, what has happened is that devolution has been exposed as not being able to work. And that there's a consistent democratic deficit where people's rights are not realised and their human rights are not um, are not are, are not promoted. And so I think that that is the that that is the lesson for whether you're in Scotland or whether you're here, that, you know, it doesn't matter if your majority votes to remain in the EU. It doesn't matter if um, all human rights instruments from law to the courts in Strasbourg to the United Nations proclaim that your rights are being denied to you and you should have them, still nothing changes. And so the sense of having your own sovereignty to, um, to ensure that your rights can be, can be upheld, I think is, is something that's really attractive to a lot of people and could be, again, transformative in how people live their lives. Sarah. To answer that point then directly. Do you mean specifically about the point about um, human rights and I need to have a wee think. To be honest, I it just there was a lot there was a lot going on there. I just I suppose just my feeling is I mean I I mean I do agree that there are a lot of issues in Northern Ireland regarding rights and particularly you know Irish language rights is a key is a key example of that where you know the as Andrea, I think you might have been alluded to that Andrea about um, the United Nations are all saying, you know, you need to have these rights protected in law and it's not getting anywhere. I guess it's just, I just don't think that constitutional change is going to, is the way to go. You know, I, I, I just believe in addressing that via Northern Ireland, really, that that's just how I would do it. Um, and I just, you know, I just want better politicians, really, you know, and I think, I think that that is, that is often my main gripe and not that I think that, you know, just a good politician will fix everything. I think that would be naive if that was my entire um, belief in politics but you know I, I just I don't believe the people that are in power really serve us very well and I suppose my in, in trying to fix the problem that Andre addresses and I, I do think that um, there's been a complete lack of respect shown to nationalists and republicans by unionist politicians within Northern Ireland um, and it's been incredibly embarrassing to watch um, and disgraceful really um, I, I would just I suppose I would tackle it by doing it through devolution and I think that's that's really the difference between Andre and I. I hope I'm not misrepresenting you there but that's that's kind of how I, I feel about that issue in particular um I suppose do you want me to go on to the the, the broader point about um go back to Clayness point or 
actually I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. Yeah. And this needs to be our kind of final round. So if you answer, I, I'm going to ask, let each of you choose, you know, a point to kind of answer. Keeping it quite brief and, you know, knowing that this is kind of like your, your final speak. So whatever point you want to take from any of the speakers there. So I was thinking, you know, by kind of a saying about United Ireland and, um, you know, whether it, it feels inevitable. I guess I don't, I don't get that sense really, you know, that, that it is an inevitability. Um, but I'm not one of those unionists that kind of think, oh, it'll never happen. And that is a, that is a way of thinking that an older generation really, really do subscribe to. You know, I'll never forget. I got a taxi one one day with a guy, and he voted for Brexit. And I said to him, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion in the in the media at the time about United Ireland. He says, "Oh, it'll never happen." And I thought, well, hang on, <laughs> you know, you voted for something that people thought would never happen, and it happened. Um, I guess I'm just in the position where I think that um, it's it's not set in stone, but I just don't know what's going to happen. And I think there are a lot of variables, a lot of things going on at the moment. I guess I just feel like we're all in a holding pattern, and everybody's wanting to see what happens. And I think you know, um, Brexit could, you know, ten years down the line, we could get to the stage where people just think this is fine, you know, we'll maybe not vote for a change or, you know, something could happen where maybe you might get people starting to think, you know, maybe maybe I'm going to consider, maybe, you know, I am going to think differently about these things. But at the moment, you know, just in my, my, my personal family, you know, nobody really, the constitutional question is low down in people's priorities, really. And I think most people just want to focus on trying to make Northern Ireland work and their, their jobs and everything else. And, and I think, you know, I think that's the case for across all communities. I just think that's in the unionist Protestant community, really. So I think that's really my hope going forward is that, you know, the constitutional question is obviously important. And obviously, you know, I love talking about it. I'm a big nerd. You know, I love I love conversations like this. But, you know, my hope is that we were the focus really is on the bread and butter and everyday issues to try and make people's lives better. OK, and Julianne, your kind of final um, well, I, I kind of felt that there was a lot there, Claire, that, you know, myself, Sarah, Andre and Kleina had in common in terms of things that we agree on. Um, and I think that's probably the best thing that we can take from this today. We're not going to convince one another of remaining in the union or persuading us to go for a United Ireland. That's not going to happen, is it, ladies? You know, that's where we're at. But we can listen to one another. Um, and obviously what's all going to happen is we're all going to take away from today going, right, I listened and this is what we need to do <laughs> for our strategies to convince and win in hearts and minds out there. That's what's going to happen and we know it. But I think if we're to do anything practical from this and, you know, if there's politicians out there listening to this today who have, we've got the ear of, basically, be they from a nationalist, Republican, unionist, loyalist background, whatever, or other, um, that's listening in, I think that the kind of general thrust is maybe finish what we started when we propped up the Good Friday Agreement and including in that the Bill of Rights rights that we have discussed that are basically used as political currency to tender and negotiate um, on our rights. Um, whereas the Bill of Rights, if we have one place as a moral and a legal obligation on those to uphold and protect our rights and where those rights are contravened or those standards are contravened that they're held to account. But I think within that, given our kind of general consensus for the socioeconomic issues, that we include those socioeconomic issues within those rights um, and start building a home in which we all can live. Thank you, Julianne. Thank you. Cleana, yourself, pick up on any point that anybody has made or make your final kind of comment. Yeah, um, again, as you said, I think on the, on the, if we take the constitutional issue out of it, um, I think fundamentally we agree um, that we all want the same thing, that we want to do to live a good life for everybody here that we want our human rights to be to be respected again so many you know i'm saying so many of these things and, and to me they're such basic like obvious things but it's very clear that in the past they haven't been implemented um cultural identity um i haven't actually touched on it much here and um, which is unusual if anyone is used to me speaking about things like this but i think cultural identity is huge in a in a past life i worked um in hillsborough um, I don't know who's more shocked at that, the people of Hillsborough or me, um, but it was such an interesting um, insight into people's perspectives around culture. I mean, the people I worked with never met anybody who spoke Irish, for example. Um, I was just finishing um, my master's in Irish history at the time I was teaching. I um, all the, And they were fascinated by it. And it was it was a great way to, and we had, we had the best to crack about it. And um, it, it was a lovely opportunity to see both sides. And 
I was there during the 12th of July and things and people were going, oh, do you feel uncomfortable going in? And I was like, no, you know, I, I, I'm not saying I like it. Don't get me wrong. Um, I don't mind something, you know, a, a parade um, in somewhere, especially somewhere like Hillsborough. I'm not going to go, no, you can't parade up the street. But I, I'm like, yes, um, it's when the flag's up for, or the bunting's up for four months later that I'm like, okay. But I, I do think that give and take is crucial. I think that the getting the insight, the personal insight into cultural identity is huge. So I think all of those little things should be respected as we go forward. Um, and uh, as Julianne said, and, and Sarah touched on as well, that it's really about listening and, and, and implementing that whatever way we go forward. Um, because if we don't do that, we're going to be having the same conversation in another 10 years time. And I think just finally, Sarah had said about that, that she feels we're in a holding pattern at the moment. And, and I can see, um, I can see where she's coming from, but I feel like then we, we you know, being in a holding pattern isn't something that we can, that we can sustain. I feel like for me, for that very reason, then we need to see what happens. Then we need to um, address the issue of the constitution because it's always going to be at the back of your mind. It's always going to be nagging at whatever we go forward to do. So, so have you know a referendum on Irish unity? See how it goes. They did it in Scotland. It didn't work out. You have your set time period, and and um, you see how things develop from there. But I think making the argument um, in terms of Irish unity or whatever it is, I just think when we um, get to the stage where there's a decision that has been made, regardless actually of what happens, I mean, obviously I, I would hope that there would be um, Irish unity. I think we need to listen to all of the points that were raised here today and just whatever we do going forward, implement them, implement those rights and make sure that everybody on in Ireland, everybody here has a fair chance at a decent life um, and good representation. And as I said before, um, the financial wealth, but also the, the quality of life um, in terms of a more human level um, that, we, that we all deserve. Okay, and then Andre, I didn't let, I didn't tell you when you were last speaking that it was your last speak. So I'm just gonna give you a very brief final thing if you want to say something in response to anybody or, or summarize something before we end. I was very struck by Sarah talking about the heart and the head, and I can really identify with that. And I think what I wanted to say as a final thing is that I respect that as well and I hear that. So when we have these conversations, it isn't just our heads that are engaged. When I talk about change, it's exciting to me and I see that that's a real opportunity. But I recognise that for somebody else, it could be really scary and it could be feel threatening. And I think that we need to find a way in this discourse that we, wherever we land over the next 10 years in this, that we, re that we come out recognizing that it isn't just going to be an economic argument. It isn't just going to be whether we can build a good healthcare system. It's gonna be so fundamental to our sense of selves, our sense of identities, uh, and it is our hearts, you know, and have we won, have we lost? I think we can build a better debate than that if we recognize that that's what's invested, but we're gonna to have to be careful with each other and that we do come away from all of these debates offering each other a sense of, you know, how much we did have in common. And also, you know, I really respect what Julianne and Sarah have brought to this. And my understanding is better as a result of this and we just need to do more of it. And actually a lot of the other issues may well be, we will, no matter where we come to, we will end up with all of those other issues we've touched on that are problematic, complex and difficult at the minute. Hopefully that all of those will be eased at the end of us. I want to thank all of you because I think this is really shown how this conversation can happen. So thank you. Thank you to all of you who have tuned in to listen to this. I hope we can bring this panel of women back together to continue the conversation.